you wish to test the claim at a significance level of alpha equals 0 0.001. For the context of this problem, the mean of the differences is the difference between the mean of each uh, collection of pairs. Uh, in other words, um, well, I think it would be better maybe to understand what we're looking at here if we look at the data. We have pre-test scores and post-test scores. It doesn't give us any context about what kind of scores or what kind of test it is, but presumably you test somebody for something, you get a score of some kind, and then after doing some sort of treatment, you test again to see if there was an improvement. So uh, what we're saying is that if you take the average of all of these, and the average of all of the post-test scores, then you subtract those, so the difference between them, as it was said here, um, mu2 minus mu1. So that means we're going to subtract the post-test score will be first minus the pretest score. So we're looking to see if there is a difference. If the post-test score is larger, then the difference is going to turn out to be positive. And we see that at least with our sample, we're seeing a positive difference. Um, we can also subtract each of these individually to see which what each individual difference is. So this post-test score minus the pretest score, so there was a positive change there and copying this down, we can see that two of them were positive and two of them were negative. So on average, if I average this up now, all the differences, I should get the same answer. I should get four as an average difference. Let me see. So what we're testing is, on average, if there is a positive difference. Okay. So after we understand the setup here, we see that the claim is that there is no improvement. In other words, the mean of the differences is nothing. There's no difference, no change. And the claim is there is some sort of change. Now notice that the claim doesn't have the greater than symbol to say that, oh, it got better after treatment. It's just saying that there was a change. So we're allowing for the possibility that things got worse after treatment. So either way, we want to see if there was an effect, right? So it it can be reduced to saying that the null is no effect and the alternative that we are interested in supporting is that there is an effect so that the treatment has some sort of effect. All right. Now Now we're going to do a full hypothesis test, and we've been asked to find the critical value, then find the test statistic, and compare those to see if we should reject the null hypothesis. And after we've decided if we should reject the null hypothesis, then we will draw a conclusion about the original claim. So let's go through these one by one. Let's start with the critical value. And we're going to use the t distribution because when we do matched pairs testing and we don't know the standard deviation, or if we only know the sample standard deviation and not the true population standard deviation, then we do a t test rather than a standard normal z test. So this is a bell curve, just like the standard normal bell curve is, but this one is going to represent the t distribution, the student's t distribution. And the mean in the middle is zero. The standard deviation varies by the sample size, so we will not label one, two, three, like we would with z-scores. Um, we have a two-tailed test, right? So that means that our critical value is going to be on the right and also on the left, and we don't know exactly where it is, but we're just placing it somewhere to get a visual. And we're about to figure out exactly what those values are in a moment here. 
And in order to figure out what they are, we're going to need to know what the significance level of the test is. And since it's two-tailed, that significance level will be split up equally on each side. So let's look up and see if they gave us this, an alpha. There I see that the significance level given was 0 0.001. Now if you split that in half, you're going to have 0 0.0005 on each side. Very tiny little tails. And we're done with the first part of this, finding the critical value. So we've set up our testing space. We have, uh, well, I'm sorry, we're not done. <laughs> Silly me, we do need to find these critical values. So how do we find that? Well, we are dealing with the t distribution with areas in the tails of 0 0.005. So the values that bound those areas are called t scores. So we are going to use the t.inverse function for a two-tailed test and put in 0 0.001, the entire alpha. If you're using the two-tailed test, it'll split up the alpha for you. The degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So you're going to need to know the sample size so that you can know the degrees of freedom. So we have to look at the sample data that was given. And in this problem, there are 1, 2, 3, 4 pairs of data. So n is 4, and the degrees of freedom then is 3. Right? You can also use, uh, to get that critical value of 12.924, and negative 12.924. To find that critical value, you can also use the t distribution that is not specifically two-tailed. And so then you just put in the 0 0.0005, half of alpha, and of course the degrees of freedom. And I forgot to use t.inverse rather than t.dist. Remember, T inverse gives you a boundary on the horizontal axis, while T dist gives you an area under the curve. So we already know the area. We're looking for the boundary. So three. Oh, I got a different answer there. I don't think I put enough zeros. That's why. There we go. All right. So that's how you find your critical value. Now that we have our goal posts set, we are going to go into the next part of this problem, which is to calculate the test statistic. Now remember the word statistic means you make a calculation from the sample data. And the word test on the front of it just means that you're going to use it to do the test. You're going to see if your test statistic falls in the red rejection region. So to calculate that, let's move over where I have stored the formula for the test statistic of a paired t-test with the sample data so that we can find all the parts. And I kind of already showed you what I did here um, before, and I'll show it again, and I'm going to just show it in a simpler way. So um, first I found the difference for each of these. So I just subtracted the post-test minus the pretest for each row. And then I just wanted the average difference. And the average of the differences is my D bar, just like if it was, normally we say X bar for the sample mean, but here we say D bar just to remind us that we're talking about a difference of pairs. And so we now have our D bar. So D bar is four, okay? We also need the mu sub d, meaning the population mean of the differences. And this is just based on what our null hypothesis says. So we always start on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true and see if we can find enough evidence against it. So here in our null hypothesis, we had the claim that there was no difference. The mean of differences is zero. So now I'm just going to say mu is zero. Also, we're going to need the standard deviation of our differences. So um, I already found the mean, right, the mean of the differences, and this is the mean of the population, so I'll say pop mean, and this was our SAMP mean. And then we're also going to want our SAMP standard deviation. So we will 
use s for that. You can say s sub d if you'd like. Either way, sample standard deviation. And now we're going to go ahead and use the standard deviation function. And since it's for a sample, make sure to choose standard deviation dot s, s t d e v dot s, and just select your differences. And the sample size, remember, is four. And the square root of four is two. So if we're going to have to divide the standard deviation by the square root of n, then we should take this number and divide it in half to get our standard error. So that's the part of the bottom part of the test statistic formula. It's, you can either call it s divided by square root of n, or you can shorten it and just call it the standard error. So standard error is taking the standard deviation and dividing by the square root, whoops, square root of n, which is four. Okay, so I'll smooth these over here. Gives a little bit more context. Degrees of, this is our sample size and our standard error. Okay, so I think we're good here. So these are all of our parts that we need for our formula. So now we can actually calculate the test statistic, TS or T for short. And so in the top there, we're going to do D bar minus the mean of the population from the null hypothesis divided by the standard error. And so here is our test statistic. Now I'm just going to highlight this in green uh, because that is the one that came from our data. And I like to distinguish it from the critical value because we're about to put the test statistic on the number line here and see how it compares with the critical value. So now I'm just going to zoom out a bit so we can see it all. So 0.874. Let's draw that on. So 0.874 is to the right of zero, but definitely less than the critical value. So I'm going to say it's somewhere maybe right around here. Oh, wait, 0.8, excuse me. What am I thinking? That's very close to zero compared to the critical value. So 0.874 is our test statistic way outside of the rejection region, which is the red shaded part. So that means we will not be rejecting the null hypothesis. In other words, our test statistic seems awfully expected, right? We expect things to be in this range, and if it goes outside of that range into the red region, then we say, ooh, that's significantly high or significantly low but it's not at all. It's just not even interesting. So we are not finding significant evidence that there is a change from the pretest to the post-test. Now, notice that we did see an average change of positive four, and certainly within each pair there was a difference, but on average that difference isn't significantly high enough for us to really think that there is a legitimate effect on the tr with the treatment. So we're going to come back and we're going to say that we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so the decision is, do you reject the null? No. And so what does that mean about the claim? Then we say there is not significant or sufficient, you could say there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the treatment produces a different, a significantly different, different score, okay? So notice I didn't say significantly higher or significantly lower because it was a two-tailed test. We were just looking for any kind of significant change. We didn't see that here. And notice that I didn't word my conclusion 
about the null hypothesis. You never talk about the null hypothesis when you're wording your final conclusion. You always talk about the original claim. And the original claim was that there, it says right here, you wish to test the claim H sub A. So the claim is that there is a significant difference. So I only talked about that. I talked about whether or not we could support it. Since we could not, like we, what we wanted to do was go, yeah, we can reject this and therefore we get to support the alternative, right? But we were unable to find sufficient evidence to reject the default assumption. Therefore, we don't have any evidence to support the alternative. And so your conclusion is really focused on the alternative, not the null hypothesis. Can be a little confusing, but that's why you're here, right? So hopefully um, you're all good with this problem and you'll come and see me if you have further questions.